The indications to perform a paracentesis are to remove tense or symptomatic ascites, to diagnose new ascites, or for the evaluation of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. One of the biggest risks in performing this procedure is related to site infection or injury of underlying structures such as bowel, bladder, or blood vessels. There are three approved sites for paracentesis needle placement, the bilateral lower quadrants approximately 5 centimeters superior and medial to the anterior superior iliac spine and 2 to 3 centimeters inferior to the umbilicus in the linea alba. Here the ascites is denoted on the ultrasound image where the dark space appears to have the intestine floating in it. The dark space is the ascites fluid pocket that you will be aiming for in your paracentesis. Also be sure to examine the skin surface to make sure that there are no vessels in the site that you will be penetrating. A pre-prepared paracentesis kit should be available at most centers and include the following equipment a 27 gauge needle and 18 gauge needle or filter needle to aspirate lidocaine, 1% lidocaine, 10 cc syringe, a catheter over needle introducer, usually 6 to 8 French, an 11 blade scalpel, gauze, fluid sample collection tubes, and a drainage tubing with 14 gauge needle and vacutainer, or one-way valve tubing and a 60 cc syringe used for drainage with the plastic bag. Sterile gloves and a face shield should be worn for this procedure. Be sure to have the patient positioned supine with the area for insertion exposed prior to donning sterile equipment. In the absence of an overt bleeding disorder, routine evaluation of platelets and INR are not required, even in patients with cirrhosis. Often, patients requiring paracentesis have low blood pressure at baseline, and the removal of a large amount of fluid can precipitate worsening of hypotension. Limiting fluid removal to 5 liters can help reduce this risk, but severe hypotension should be addressed prior to performing the procedure. Once site selection has occurred with the ultrasound probe, cleanse the area with chlorhexidine or betadine, being sure to cleanse a large area and prevent contamination during the procedure. A sterile drape may then be applied, being careful to remove the adhesive backing that will keep the drape in place during the procedure. Persistent ascites fluid leakage following needle placement can be decreased by using a Z-track technique. This technique involves using laterally directed force on the skin as the needle is inserted so that when the needle is removed, a continuous passage is not present, but rather the tissue pushes against itself to keep the passage closed. Draw up lidocaine from the vial using a filter or other large gauge needle into a 10 cc syringe. Place the 27 gauge needle onto the syringe and inject a wheel of lidocaine at the selected site. Puncture through the center of the wheel and aspirate as the needle is advanced to ensure no vasculature is penetrated. Stop when ascites fluid is returned and inject lidocaine along the entire tract as the needle is withdrawn. Set up the collection tubes and catheter system while the anesthetic takes effect. Make a stab incision using an 11 blade scalpel at the center of the wheel site. Now with a syringe in place on the catheter over needle device, pull traction as the needle punctures the skin and advance the needle through the stab incision. Continue advancing until ascites fluid is returned. Advance 5 millimeters further to ensure the catheter, and not just the needle tip, are within the peritoneal cavity. Keep the hand controlling the syringe steady. Now, advance the catheter forward. Do not withdraw the needle. Once the catheter has been fully advanced, the needle may then be withdrawn. Turn the three-way stopcock off to the patient 
and connect a 60cc syringe to the stopcock. Now you may withdraw samples to be sent for analysis. If cultures are being collected, be sure to inoculate the culture bottles at the bedside to increase the probability of isolating a bacterial organism. Drainage tubing may now be connected to finish draining the additional fluid. Using the Y-shaped tubing with one-way valves, the 60cc syringe can be used as a pump to manually extract fluid. Although the procedure of manual extraction may seem cumbersome, it will decrease the number of vacutainers that are required for a proper extraction. Keep in mind when using the bag suction device, the longer portion of tubing will go to the bag and allow it to be hung on the side of the bed. The shorter section of tubing will connect directly to the catheter in the patient, while the 60cc syringe can be attached to the center port to provide manual suction. Notice that the one-way valves prevent backflow of ascites fluid into the catheter and will preferentially direct it into the bag for collection. The 14-gauge needle and straight tubing may be connected to a vacutainer for automatic extraction of fluid. When using the vacutainer system, be sure to keep the system closed to the atmosphere while the needle is in place through the bottle lid to prevent losing suction. The patient should have hemodynamic monitoring for an hour following the procedure to ensure hypotension does not occur from fluid shift. If hypotension is encountered, albumin may be used to increase oncotic pressure to hold fluid within the vasculature. If a diagnosis of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is confirmed, albumin at a dose of half to one gram per kilogram should be given IV in addition to antibiotics to decrease the risk of hepatorenal syndrome. Once the desired fluid has been removed, the catheter may be removed with smooth, gentle traction. Place a gauze and bandage to control local bleeding. If continued bleeding is noted, a figure of eight stitch may be used to close the opening of the tract. 